Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the City of London Investment Trust PLC Investor Presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged. They can be submitted at any time. Just use the Q&A tab on the right-hand corner of your screen, type in your questions and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, all questions can be reviewed and we'll publish those responses where it's appropriate to do so. Before we begin, we'd like to submit the following poll. And if you give that the kind attention, I'm sure that'd be greatly welcomed by the company. I'd now like to hand over to fund manager, Job Curtis. Good afternoon, Job. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Mark. And it's um, very good to talk to everybody. And I'll have, in this presentation, I'll give a bit about the background of City of London, also how we've been performing recently and over the long run and what have been the contributors and detractors that performance, and also how we see the market and how the portfolio is currently positioned. So to start off with some of the background to the trust, um, as most of you will be aware, our objective is to grow shareholders' income and capital over the long run, through, principally through investments in equities listed on London Stock Exchange. Uh, one of the great features of investment trusts is they have independent board of directors, and City's um, board is very independent, and its chairman is Laurie Magnus, who has a long career in corporate finance. He's an advisor with Evercore, but he's also more recently been appointed ethics advisor to the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak. Uh, City has almost £2 billion worth of net assets, um, and we've been very popular in recent years. We've issued a lot of shares to meet demand for people for ISAs, etc., and for their portfolios. And um, we've almost doubled our share capital over the last 10 years, issuing typically at a premium of about 2% to our asset, net asset value per share. Um, back in September 2020, we actually fell to a discount around 2%. And we bought in 1.2 million shares at that level. And more recently, over the last couple of weeks, we've also been at a discount. And um, as has been um, publicly disclosed, um, uh, we've we've also bought in some shares on a 2% discount, or around 2%. Um, I've been um, manager of the trust for a very long time, since 1991. It's been a huge privilege to be the manager of such a great trust. Um, I've been um, joined uh, I've worked with David Smith for over 10 years, and he was appointed deputy in, in 2021. Um, the trust has a very competitive management fee, and it was already low, and the independent board of directors recently reduced it to 0.3% in, in negotiations with Janice Henderson. Um, so it's even lower than it, than it has been, but obviously that reflects the growth in the assets of the trust in recent years. So our ongoing charge ratio, which measures all our costs, including the management fee, was 0.37% in our last financial year and is heading lower this year as a result of the lower management fee. Um, one of the features of the investment trust is they can um, issue debt for investment in equities. And in recent years, we've taken advantage of the very low interest rates that were around. And so we secured some very cheap long-term debt. So we got a 30 million pound note going out to 2046 with a coupon of only 2.67% and a 50 pound note, um, 50 million pound note um, going out to 2049 with a coupon or interest rate of 2.94 percent so you know we just have to beat 2.67 and 2.94 for those um those borrowings to um be accretive to our return and and so we've kind of secured really attractive cheap financing for the next 25 years for our investors um david and i work in the janice henderson global equity income team uh it's global um, so, which is helpful that when you're looking at the UK large companies, to be able to compare them with um, um, comparable companies overseas because they are often operate in global markets. Um, I'm actually the oldest uh, member of the team, but um, James Henderson is only two weeks younger than me. But we're obviously with colleague, we've got the benefit of experience, but we're with colleagues who are kind of mid-career and, and earlier in their careers as well. Um, and some of them will be obviously much closer to sort of trends in society than I would be and so we all contribute um, to, and we're a very harmonious team as can be seen by the length of service of, of the very and the stability of the team. <clears throat> um, in terms of the investment philosophy and how we manage the trust, um, it's valuation driven. I'm really trying to um, judge whether the share price valuation reflects the prospects of the companies and trying to buy into those where I think the valuation is cheap and obviously Dividend yield is is the kind of starting point, and we're trying to be in companies that can both pay a decent dividend, but also grow their dividend and grow their profits. 
And for that to happen, they need to be investing enough for the future. Um, so we're not, we're, we're trying to avoid, you know, we'll succeed trying to avoid the sort of high yielding companies that end up cutting their dividends, which aren't investing enough. Um, in addition, it's a pretty conservative approach. I mean, we like companies with good cash generation, they're best able to both pay their dividends and support capital expenditure. And we like strong balance sheets, especially for companies in cyclical industries. When you get a downturn, um, if a company's got too many borrowings, um, then they're very likely to cut their dividend. So we're looking for a margin of safety in, in our investments. And the sort of flow chart at the bottom shows the kind of overall process, beginning with ideas, you know, starting really with value. And then we do a lot of individual analysis. I mean, Janet Henson, we've got a we've got some excellent analysts of our own. Um, so I do my own analysis, but also um, helped by our analysts. And we've got analysts both here and in across the world who, who look at the companies in a lot of detail. And then the portfolio construction, where the kind of tilt of the income tilt of portfolio is very important. Um, the portfolio yields above the market average, but we've got some low yielders in it, which have done very well, which I'll talk about later. Um, and then we're looking for the overall kind of risk of the portfolio and um, having a sort of diversification across sectors. I'll give you, when we look at the portfolio, that will become a lot clearer. So our next section, I'll just talk a bit about performance. So the chart on this slide um, goes back to the whole 32 years since I've been manager of the trust back to July 1991. And you can see we've um, enjoyed a decent outperformance over the FTSE All Show over that period. The top line is Citi's performance and the, the bottom line is the FTSE All Show, which is our benchmark. Um, best performance against the All Show has tended to be in more difficult markets. In a, in a kind of rising market, will make you we typically would make you gains, but it's in the falling market, our best historically, our best relative gains have been achieved, such as in 2022 when um after the invasion of Ukraine when when markets had a bit of a difficult time and we we performed well during that period. Um looking at the sort of short term performance, we're, we're ahead of the FTSE all share, as you can see, over one year, three years, five years, and ten years. So um but but obviously, you know, we don't perform in every market, um, but over, over, over the long run, we have delivered. <clears throat> Just looking at the sort of most recent sort of six month period that we've reported, six months to um, December 2023, just sort of looking at some of the um, trends. I mean, I think it was a period when um, expectations in the markets grew that inflation had peaked and interest rates had peaked. And so there was kind of a lot of enthusiasm for the more sickle sectors and the kind of more defensive sectors actually underperformed in this period. So pharmaceuticals where we were underweight, as rather being, being having less than the market average, that was actually a big contributor. And we, although we've got a holding AstraZeneca, we're below market average for that. So that was our biggest stock contributor. But some of our more interest rates um, sensitive se sectors like uh, real estate investment trusts, like property companies, life insurance, and um, household goods and home construction, which really means house builders, they performed, performed well. Um, during the period um, and look at the individual stocks. I mean, um, BA Systems has been a real winner right since the beginning of the Ukraine war. It's a stock we it's our biggest holding now. Um, it's performed, you know, it's done achieved that through strong performance. It's doubled since the start of the Ukraine war. And basically, um, the period of, of the post Cold Cold War, there was a peace dividend. I'm afraid has ended, and countries are understandably rearming. And um, BA Systems is incredibly well placed. I mean, it's our biggest defense contractor in the UK, but also the fifth biggest in the United States. And it's also got big interest in continental Europe and in Asia Pacific with countries like Japan, Australia, New Zealand, and in the Middle East with, with Saudi Arabia. So um, it's really um, got loads of good technology and a very strong management group who are executing well at the moment. Um, 3i Group is an um, investment company that invests in private companies. And in particular, it's got a very big um, holding an action, which is a discount retailer in content Europe, and that's um, performed very well. Uh, Roundhill Music was a kind of music royalties fund, which got taken over, and an M&G is a mixture of life insurance and fund management. So looking at the um, detracting areas, well, it's it's really the more defensive areas, uh, detracting particular food producers, where Nestle, which has been a great stock for us over the years, had a difficult six months uh, and in aerospace and defense we didn't hold rolls royce which um, doesn't pay a dividend um so it's perhaps understandable why we didn't hold, hold it but of course ba systems did well in aerospace and defense 
also we were underway oil and shell during the period which didn't help um and then um the biggest single detractor was, was st james's place which uh, the uk's biggest wealth manager where um there's been a change in its um it, they're going to have to change the structure of how they charge fees to clients and that um caused the share price to fall since um this end of last year uh, they've also um had to make a provision for um repaying clients where they haven't had an annual view so we've um we've reduced the holding by about a third uh, but it is uk's biggest wealth manager and we think longer term there's a lot of value in the shares <clears throat> uh, in terms of the portfolio activity in terms of the kind of main changes we made in terms of new buys and complete sales we sold out of woodside energy which is an australian listed um company which is really focused on liquefied natural gas where the prospects are good longer term as it's a great fuel for the energy transition um but short term there's quite a glut in markets with a lot of us um production meeting the markets and we switched that into e i which is an italian uh headquartered international oil company with good prospects our bigger holdings in oil and gas are in shell and bp and total energy is a french oil company we also bought a new holding in burberry which is the uk luxury goods company luxury is having a difficult time given the slowdown in china but when we bought burberry the shares were 40 percent off the 12-month high and we think there's good um long-term prospects even if it's quite difficult i mean we've bought quite a small holding to start with and we're going to watch it and um hopefully accumulate as as some um, the news flow improves and then a new holding in hilton foods which kind of is a meat packer and distributor of meat starting with a with a contract with tesco's and it's now expanded very successfully into continental europe and also into australia new zealand and it's just very recently run a contract with um walmart of canada so which opens another new territory for it uh in terms of complete sales we we sold our holding in cisco uh quite well which made a decent profit um and they've made a big acquisition and suffering a slowdown in trading we also sold um ferguson which was originally listed in the uk is now fully listed in the us had something very re-rating and might be vulnerable to a downturn in, in us construction and sanofi we sold in the pharmaceutical sector uh, which had a profit warning it's a french um, headquarter company and we switched that mainly into gsk or what used to be called glaxo which um where we think the prospects are better <clears throat> um in terms of the revenue this looks at our last financial year which was the 30th of june 2023 and we put the dividend up by 2.6 percent in that year which is our 57th consecutive annual increase we could never have achieved our long record dividend increase which is the longest of any investment trust going back to 1966 and we, we could never achieve that without the investment trust structure so in the bad years for dividends we're able to dig into what called a revenue reserve to keep the dividend growing. So I think the table well illustrates it, looking at the, our last five financial years with our 30th junior end. And so if you look at um, the, the column on the furthest to right, the 30th of June 19, you can see that um, this is just before the pandemic, that earnings were comfortably covering dividends, and earnings per share of 19.76. We paid out in dividends 80.6. So we paid out 94.1% and put the other roughly six percent back into the revenue reserve and then of course the following year covid hit a lot of companies stopped paying their dividends FTSE 100 dividends went down by about 36 percent was worse outside the FTSE 100 and we had to dig into those reserves more than any time in the whole of my career of managing city london and we actually carried on growing our dividend from 18.6 to 19.0 but we um we we, we only earned 15.73 so we actually paid out 21 percent from reserves the following where we had to pay out another 11.8 percent from reserves when we got to 2022 um we actually then were comfortably covering our dividend earnings went to, were 20.72 having gone up by 21 percent in that year and um dividends per share were up to 19.6 last year the earnings sum um, declined slightly to um 20.1 um, but were narrowly covered by our earnings per share as you can see um basically um a lot of the mining stocks which had had a boom in the previous year had reduced dividend distribution so though we made it up a bit from growth and dividends from financials overall dividends were slightly down but you have to see that in a con of the earnings per share was rather slightly down that our dividend when it was ahead but you have to see that in the context of the exceptionally strong uh, year previously to 30 june 2022 
this next slide just shows you the dividend growth going right back to 1966. I said it, it couldn't have been done without the investor trust structure, but we've also benefited from being in, having a core of very consistent companies in the portfolio and also a good spread of income. And the, the pie chart on the right just shows you how well spread our income is by industry, not dependent on any one industry for, for our, our dividends. So um, it really goes back to your principle, not having all your eggs in one basket. You know, we, we're, we're kind of well spread and we're not going to be hit by any particular problem in, the, in any particular industry. So turn talk now a bit about um, the market and um, how I'm seeing it and also the, how the portfolio is positioned. Um, this next chart just shows you the underperformance over the last 10 years of the UK market as compared with, with um, the world index. So the top chart is the world index excluding the UK, which has gone up 144%. And the bottom chart is the UK FTSE All Shares only gone up 63%. And I think the main reason is the world index is dominated by the big US technology companies, which has deservedly done extraordinarily well over the period. And there isn't really any, there was very little equivalent in, in the UK market. Um, uh, so that's the main reason. But I think even if you um, strip that, that factor out, if you look at UK stocks um, compared with um, most overseas stocks, particularly American stocks, some um, UK stocks are a lot cheaper on a like for like basis. You can power our, our oil companies, say with US oil companies. Um, and I think there is a reason for that, that, that you know, UK domestic institutions have increasingly, in fact, over recent decades have moved very heavily into fixed interest for various reasons. And where they own equities, both they and also um, wealth managers have gone very global in equity exposure. And so, you know, there really hasn't been much enthusiasm for UK equities, just left them, lead, 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 led them, and you know, really very reasonably valued. And um, you know, we've seen a lot of, and because we've got an open system for corporate control in UK, you've seen a lot of takeover activity. And we've experienced that in our portfolio. We've had companies like Morrison's, which got taken over, and more recently, we've had Roundhill Music, which I mentioned earlier, and also Win Canton, which is um, a logistics company, which has been bid for by, uh, well, initially by a French private company, and. Um, more successfully by an American company and it's been taken over. So, um, and whilst this discount for UK equities persists, I, I would um, expect the takeover activity to continue. <clears throat> um, in turn, next chart just talks a little bit about market valuation. And I've got two charts. Um, the chart on the left is the sort of price earnings ratio. It was one of the um, most standard measures of valuation for the market and it compares sort of share price with earnings or profits per share. And the fact that the P of the market on a historic basis is around 10 times is, is really very cheap. That's very much at the cheaper end of the long-term scale. And that chart goes back um, slightly over, almost slightly over 20 years, as you can see. Um, <clears throat> and so that's very favorable. And it's well below the long-term average um, as you can see, which is that middle line. Um, the chart on the right just compares the yields with, um, of the equity market with, um, with, with both base rates and also with 10-year um, gilt yields, which, which come bonds and 30-year gilt yields. And you know, for most of the period, which goes back 10 years, equities actually yielded more than, um, than fixed interest, which is kind of bonds and, and base rates. Um, and that's obviously changed in the last two years with the move up in interest rates in order to counter inflation. Um, but actually, if you go back to earlier in my career, um, equities tended to yield less than fixed interest. A very good reason that dividends grow over time whilst, whilst fixed interest is fixed. So I'm not too worried that the equities now yield roughly, you know, similar to kind of gilts and slightly below base rates. I think the fact that you've got um, the promise of dividend growth from equities justifies them on a yield basis. So I think the valuation looks quite reasonable. I mean, obviously inflation is falling. The most recent CPI figure has it at 3.6%. And uh, uh, the way the CPI inflation is constructed, which is on a 12-month basis, um, as some of the big increase in energy fall out um, and you know our bills for energy are likely to come down, um, that will br bring inflation back um, to the 2% target range. But I think um, I do think this kind of wars can we can completely declare victory because there is still quite a lot of wage pressure in the economy. 
um, in particular minimum wage went up by 10% and that kind of ricochets through the whole structure of wages. And so um, I think the Bank of England will tread quite cautiously, but they'll probably watch what the other overseas banks are doing, central banks are doing, the Fed and the ECB, and I doubt they'll want to be out of step, too much out of step with them. So I think that interest rates, I mean, most um, markets now seem to be expecting sort of 325 basis points cuts in interest rates this year, but both here and in the US. So um, so I think the interest rates have peaked and they are, they are coming down, but it could be that, you know, wage growth proves quite sticky, which prevents it. Uh, I mean, I don't see interest rates going back to the kind of near zero levels we had during the pandemic. I think that was a kind of unique um, situation. Uh, so, you know, overall, um, I think the kind of geopolitical picture is obviously very difficult with the war in Ukraine and the problems in the Middle East and the issues with China. So, um, and in addition, the, the banks, central banks, you know, instead of they've been they've been in, in since the financial crisis, they've often been buying up bonds in, in the in the gilt market and the US Treasury market. They're now doing the reverse, which is called quantitative tightening, and that that could um, be a headwind for 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 bonds and equities. So, um, so we're sort of cautious, but um, but I would say for investors UK equities, you're paid to hold on. I mean, the market is yielding. Um, about 3.8 percent as an average and um, uh, so I think that's a pretty attractive yield given the promise of dividend growth so our gearing um, which I mentioned which are mainly those fixed rate borrowings which are on very cheap rates which I mentioned earlier our gearing is around 7.3 percent which gives us a little bit of um, extra advantage into a rising market um, but is is kind of still given we our portfolio is a fairly um it's, it's got below average volatility um so you know it, it, it's um it, it doesn't change our overall conservative stance <clears throat> so to talk a bit more about the um portfolio itself there are 84 holdings um you know we, as a trust we are predominantly in large cap uk listed stocks so you'd be not surprised for about 77 percent of FTSE 100 stocks uh, but of course, these are all global companies, and I'll shortly show you just how global they are, or how global a portfolio is. We've got about 10% in the rest of the UK market, the mid mid cap stocks, and um, and one or two small caps. Um, we have 13% in overseas listed. So these are companies which are list which kind of complement our portfolio. I mean, for, for example, in oil, we have Total Energies. Uh, which didn't cut its dividend in 2020, unlike Shell and BP. So we got both. We have got Shell and BP. We've also got Total, and in pharmaceuticals, in addition to AstraZeneca and GSK, we've got um, Merck of the US, Novartis, and Johnson and Johnson. And so they're often companies that can provide us some bit of extra diversification in a sector, or have kind of a unique edge, which which you can't really find in the UK market. Um, in terms of this kind of industry blocks within the portfolio, the biggest single block is, is financials, which make up 27% of the portfolio. And our um, biggest weight within this is, is banks. And, uh, you know, for the first time, for a very long time, we're slightly overweight banks. We think the current interest rate environment is very positive for banks. It's much easier for them to earn their kind of margin between what they um, lend to customers and and what they pay for in in deposits um it's is is much easier in, with kind of these levels of interest rates so um in particular where and we think banks are very attractively valued relative to their tangible book values and the kind of returns they're making so um although hsbc is our biggest holding um uh, we are actually um slightly we're slightly underweight compared to the market average in hsbc but we do or we are overweight in Lloyds, NatWest, and, and Barclays in the UK banking sector. We've got about 10% in banks. We also think there's a lot of value in life insurance sector. We've got um, big holdings in Phoenix and Legal in general. And we've also um, got MNG, which is a mixture of life insurer and fund managers. So, and we've got some interesting holdings in, in the kind of um, other financial sector, um, which includes 3i Group, which of course um, is the, uh, in, in, uh, the owner of private um, firms, which I talked about earlier. <clears throat> our biggest, se our second biggest sector is consumer staples. These kind of make the everyday and sell everyday goods uh, for a very stable area. Um, we a lot of global um, exposure here. Our biggest single holding here is Unilever, 
which has a big presence in emerging markets um, as well as developed markets. Um, but we've also got in this area British American tobacco and imperial brands, which are tobacco stocks, but um, pay a very attractive dividend yield and help us own some lower yielding stocks by owning them. Um, and then um, in industrial is our third biggest weight, 12%, with BA Systems, our biggest single holding in, in industrials. But we've also got some um, interesting other holdings, kind of you know, smaller FTSE companies like um, IMI or Road Talker outside the FTSE 100. And also this includes um, in packaging, we've got DS Smith, which is in merger discussions with Mondi, which we also hold, which could end up um, forming a, a kind of a larger kind of leading packaging group um, in the UK market. Uh, then oils are next biggest weight, 8.6%. Shell's our biggest holding there. Also got BP um, total. And um, then the fifth biggest weighting is in, is healthcare, which is mainly pharmaceuticals, with AstraZeneca our biggest holding. So, so they they get so those kind of five industry blocks, you know, do give you around three quarters of the whole portfolio, and they're they're kind of fairly diverse mixture. But you know, with it underneath, there are some lots of interesting other companies such as the Wind Canton, which I mentioned to you in logistics, which was taken over. And in I should have mentioned in non-life insurance, we've had some very good results recently for companies including um, in Lloyd's Market, Beasley and Hiscox and Munich Ray, the um, German reinsure, which you're also in. Uh, so this um, next slide just um, looks at the portfolio um, and it drills down to the underlying sales of, of the companies we invest in. And what's intriguing is that some two thirds of the underlying sales or revenue come from outside the UK. So if about a third comes, it's for the UK and two thirds outside. And so I would argue that you know, through City London's portfolio, you, you get global exposure to global growth, but had a discounted UK stock market rating. And when you look at the spread of the global, you know, the overseas markets, you know, 23% North America, but there's plenty outside North America, including Asia Pacific, um, emerging markets and, and Europe and, and a little bit in Japan as well. <clears throat> uh, so looking at our top 10 holdings at um, end of February, BA Systems, the biggest single holding which I've already talked about. Um, Relics is our second biggest holding. This is a business information provider, leader in providing business information and risk uh, to insurance companies, for example, and also got a very big, the number two in, in providing information to, to law firms and number one in, in science and technology. Uh, it's a very high quality company. It's got quite a low dividend yield. It's only yield slightly over 2%. So it's an example, it's performed very well over the long run, it, it's kind of not, it was originally a print-based business, now 90% digital. It's transformed itself over the years, and um, it's a good example of a kind of lower yielding share that we've got in the portfolio, which which kind of we hold, which obviously contribute more on the growth side, capital appreciation, and balanced by some of our kind of other stocks, which are more more contributing on the yield side. Um, uh, then um, elsewhere in the portfolio, you've got so you've got two oil companies in the top ten, Shell and BP. Uh, one bank HSBC, and then in the consumer staples sectors, we've got Unilever, BA Tobacco, and, and Diageo, or, or that Diageo being the UK's leading alcohol beverage companies, number one in the world globally in spirits um, outside China, um, and number one in the US, which is and huge not just with Scotch whiskey, but also the biggest um, by value with tequila, which is the fastest growing category in, in the US. So the top 10 holdings make up about a third of the portfolio. Um, and then if you look at the next 10 down, um, which make up 22%, uh, again, it's pretty good spread, lots of 2% positions here. Um, Tesco's, which is counted as consumer staples, which um, you know has been doing very well, um, very competitive now against uh, hard discounters like Lidl and Aldi and um, very much our leading food retailer in the UK with a share of about 30% of the UK food retail market. Um, then several financial stocks you've got m g which i've already talked about phoenix which is a life assurer uh, and eagle in general another life assurer and then two banks uh, lloyds and, and that west also um uh, in 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 this next 10. uh then we've got rio tinto which is uh, number 13 that's um our main mining stock um biggest exposure to iron ore but got a growing exposure to copper 
um, in addition. And then we've got um, our biggest utility is National Grid, which is, um, we obviously think it was a UK company. It was actually just over half its business in the UK. The other half is in, in um, the US, where it's um, very big in the northeast of the US. And, and as, the, um, as we move to electrification over, over, the, over the coming years, so National Grid will ha have a huge prospects in terms of um, uh, building out our electricity network which um, will need to be expanded to increase its capacity. So I think that's some quite attractive growth prospects both here and in the US for, for, for National Grid. And then GSK, that used to be called Glaxo, is our second biggest um, pharmaceutical stock. So to sort of finish off before I um, pass it over to Mark for, for the questions, um, I'll leave you with kind of you know three main messages. That, um, we've got the longest track record of any investment trust, in fact, of, any UK quota company I know about for dividend increases going right back to 1966, 57 years of annual dividend increases. As I explained, it's obviously a diverse portfolio with, with a core of you know, consistent companies, but also it's the investment trust structure. We couldn't have achieved it without the investment trust structure, which allows you to you know, pay back into your revenue reserve in the good years for dividends and then draw down from that reserve to keep the dividend growth going in, in the, in the um, difficult years which inevitably occur for dividends across the market. Uh, we have very competitive charges, ongoing charging ratio last year of only 0.37%, lowest in our sector and heading lower with the recent um, reduction in our management fee to 0.30%. And we've achieved long-term outperformance of the FTSE Orsha index, as I've discussed, but not in every year, but over the long run and through a conservative investment style. So thank you very much for listening. And at this point, I'm very had very happy to pass it back to Mark um, to answer any questions. Job, that's very kind. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you for your presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions using the Q&A tab just situated on the right hand corner of the screen. But just before we go into the Q&A session, I'd like to remind you that a recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A can be accessed via your Investor Meet Company dashboard. Um, Job, we've received a number of questions from investors throughout your presentation. So firstly, thank you to everybody for your engagement uh, this afternoon. Uh, Job, if I may just start with uh, the first question here um, about I guess, around your approach to investing, given your cautious approach, how do you balance the desire for high dividend yields with the need for capital growth, particularly perhaps in sectors that may be traditionally seen as higher risk? Yes, yeah, so if we, we take a sort of portfolio approach. So, you know, as you know, looking at that, let's say that top 10 uh, going back, um, you know, there, some of those are kind of high yielding shares like, you know, BA Tobacco, for example, is, is clearly a high yielding share. Um, you know, Shell and BP are kind of middle of the market yields. Um, but then there are some quite low yielding. I mean, BAE relics, HFC is high yield. BAE relics are, are particularly low yielding, as is 3i group. They all yield below three. So I think it's just a question of sort of balancing out, you know, having some, identifying some really attractive growth stocks uh, and then balancing out with with high but secure dividend yields, companies that where you, and I think key is kind of looking at the cash flow. I mean, that is really critical for us, whether the dividend payments are covered by cash flow and whether there's enough to pay for CapEx as well and the necessary investment over the long term. So, I mean, that's obviously why you, you pay for a fund manager to do it. And um, if it was easy and a computer could do it, then that, then that would be how, how it would be done. So uh, it's it's a you know, question of kind of judging it really and uh, balancing out you know, growth stocks within the portfolio um, with secure high yielders and trying to avoid the um, the, the, the really risky um, companies that are going to end up cutting the dividends. And as I said in the presentation, I think, um, you know, indebtedness is quite critical. I think companies with high levels of indebtedness are inevitably, there are certain sectors where, where they've got very secure um, earnings. I mean, utilities can can carry more debt than other companies because you, when, when they have regulated, um, uh, you know, regulated profits and uh, prices, and you know, with something like, you know, water or electricity, you know, people have to pay their bills. So, uh, so that the companies, because say predictable companies, can carry more debt than than other sectors. But but where you get a cyclical sector, where you get sort of swings in trading, then inevitably, if you've got a a lot of debt then when 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 things turn down you're going to think first about sort of paying your bank manager and your your you know your bonds make sure you get your interest payments in your bonds and the dividends get sacrificed very quickly so i think that's a 
uh, you know, a very important factor. Thank you, Joe. That's great. Um, just turning to the next question from David around, I guess this is around ESG, and it reads, in the context of increasing demand for sustainable investments, I mean, how do you position the fund, I guess, to address uh, investor expectations around ESG? Well, we we do um, look at ESG as part of the process, but it but we don't exclude sectors. And, you know, we we, we for us, it's more a question of evaluating both the risks and opportunities for, from ESG. So if we go back to the slide showing the price unit, you see in that stock analysis section in the middle that the ESG factors, you know, are there. And that, because ESG uh, stands for environmental, social and governance. And, you know, all of these play, you know, important part in, in our, you know, evaluation. And, you know, we want to be in companies that are sustainable for the long run in terms of kind of got a long-term future for sure. But, um, but, you know, it's a question of valuation and um, I mean, obviously tobacco companies in the long run, people will stop smoking and smoking declines every year. But it's a question of how much that's factored into valuations. And, you know, with BAT, in our view, offering a secure 9% dividend yield, it is, to our, in our view, in the valuation, particularly as they're growing, uh, they're less harmful um, product side of it. So I think it's... Um, you know, uh, and but but there are other parts of the portfolio where there are opportunities. I talked about national grid, new opportunity for electrification, SSE, which is out, outside our top, top 20, but in our top 30 is another. So that's our biggest um, uh, energy um, company where, where in the UK from new, renewables, particularly from hydroelectric and, and wind. And so that's a company we've got obviously big opportunities from electrification. I mean, actually, the miners in their own way, though you wouldn't think of them as being sort of ESG stocks, but I mean, copper, we're going to need a lot of copper going forward, if, you know, if the world electrifies in the way people are talking about. And so, you know, so there are kind of ways in the portfolio that, you know, you can benefit from it. Um, so I think um, I think it needs to be a debate though, ESG. I think um, these things aren't set in stone. I mean, I think quite wrongly, a lot of uh, so-called ESG or responsible funds excluded defence stocks. I mean, they've had, there's been a rethink since the Ukraine war, because clearly if we don't have companies like BAE, making sophisticated weapons, then, you know, you know, dictators like Putin are just going to walk into countries without, you know, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be defenseless, you know, to coin the phrase. So um, so I, I think that um, a company like BAE is, is for the social good, you know. So I think it needs, I don't think the debate is quite as clear cut as some, as some think. Thank you, Job. Um, let's take, uh, I guess, the next question from Robin. Thank you for your question, Robin. It reads as follows. Do you think that sterling is undervalued against the US dollar and the euro? Just a kind of a, get your thoughts on that. Uh, well, I think currencies are notoriously difficult to predict. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm also, I'm a, I think the UK has got a lot, lot to offer, but, you know, we do have, we do run deficits, you know, on, on our, trade and manufactured goods in particular have to import goods and we have a surplus on services. Um, I think it's it's just very difficult. I mean, the US has got um, huge strengths. It's the world reserve currency and it's also a mistake to bet against the US. Um, I mean, the euros, I mean, there's still worries about the whole structure of the euro, you know, where you've got a um, currency union without a fiscal union. But, um, but having said that, the euro has been kept going for quite a few years now um so i think it's it's just very difficult to pronounce on on currencies some um, really i mean in terms of cities portfolio we've got plenty of overseas exposure so if sterling was to decline you know we you know we do benefit in that extent from the value you know, just the translation effect of the value of overseas sales and profits being higher um when translated back in sterling for the british investor uh, but at the same point, we you know we do have our domestic stocks as well. So um, I've I kind of rather let currencies swing through. I mean, I have to say, over the years, sterling has has declined mainly. I mean, we obviously we had a period but we, we when North Sea oil uh, came came in when when it, when sterling was quite strong. There have been periods of sterling of sterling strength, but on the very long term chart, if you go back to kind of 1945, I think. We were over the exchange rate was over four against the dollar at that point, so it has some been a bit of a decline. And um, uh, so it uh, it doesn't feel. I mean, at the moment it seems to be trend in a bit of a sort of trend, really. Um, uh, so that you know we haven't seen a big break in currencies very recently. But um, I, I find it a difficult question to answer, to be to be honest. 
no problem that's the one that's the difficult one that's come through um okay that's <laughs> excuse me just turn to a question i guess around your exposure um geographic exposure do you see the percentage of overseas listed companies currently i think it's stated at around 13 percent remaining at these levels or do you see it increasing versus the uk uh, so yeah it's quite if you go back to that it's um it has fluctuated so if you go back to 2019 it was 10 percent then it went all the way up to 17 percent in 2022 and it's actually come back a bit as because uh, i generally feel the uk is cheap compared to other markets so i have if anything been switching out taking some very decent profits and some of my overseas holdings and switching back into the uk in fact we did you know we we had microsoft for and made 10 times our money we bought it we owned it for over 10 years and it was extremely successful and i sold it last year um obviously too early but we'd made more than 10 times our money at the time i sold it it was market capitalization it was almost a whole of the uk stock market it's now i think worth more than the whole of the uk stock market and so um and when i bought it, it was on a yield of three percent and when i sold it, it was on a dividend yield of below one percent so um you know but i think um I think overseas has got a place to pay in the portfolio, but I'm probably more enthusiastic at the moment about the value in the, in the UK stock market. And the companies, as I was saying, are global companies often in the UK. They're not, it's not mm. like they're kind of, um, as I showed you that slide, two thirds of our sales come from overseas. It's, it's often, um, you know, but they're very, just very cheap compared to their equivalents overseas. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, let's um, uh, turn to a question from Roger. Thank you, Roger. Is AI going to be a problem or a benefit to City of London Investment Trust? Um, well, I think, um, I think actually Terry Smith's reading his, some of his stuff, and he, he made a very good point. When these new technologies come in, it's, you know, often it's not obvious who the winners are from it, you know, but I think, um, I think we'll be looking out for both, you know, which stocks look to benefit and which, which industries look to be crushed by it. I mean, I can remember when the internet came in and BT spun out its Yellow Pages uh, division called Yell, and that was um, they called it Yell. I think the stock Yell, and they put they put a lot of debt into it, and um, that eventually went bust. It didn't wasn't immediately apparent, but it but obviously and uh, nowadays if you're looking for a telephone number, you just look it up on Google or or, um, or look up the website. So uh, so you know we we'll be watching out for that type of situation, but certainly within our portfolio, uh, one stock that um, does seem well placed to benefit is relics which i talked about our second biggest holding which is um the second biggest in legal services globally um and um it's number two, in particular in the u.s market you know it's number two there and it's got an incredibly high quality business and uh, certainly ai is an area which where they've done a already you know got done a lot of work on and um seem well placed to benefit but it's i think it's very early days in terms of you know how this technology is going to change things and um who are going to be the winners and losers but i would certainly identify relics as some um, one within our portfolio that looks like to be a winner from it thank you roger i hope that uh, answers your question um i guess we're coming up to the the final question as other, other questions come through it's a more of a broader uh, get your view on the uh, the market moving forward but what's your outlook for 24 there's obviously a lot happening in terms of politics interest rates but really keen to understand if uh, your views as to where we end up yeah, I mean, politics is, um, there's a lot of elections going on. Obviously, we're almost certainly going to have an election here. And I think you can, I think our election has to be by January next year, but I almost certainly will be <laughs> sometime later this year. And um, if the opinion polls are accurate, it's obviously Labour are very well placed for, for majority. But obviously, the, you know, there will be changes. But this, you know, Labour opposition looks very different to say if Jeremy Corbyn had become Prime Minister, which would have been a much um, more radical agenda. Um, and then in America, you've got the uh, battle between President Biden, ex-President Trump, and um, but so, so that will need to be watched. Um, so you know, there's both that political volatility and the kind of ongoing geographical geopolitical tensions, which I also talked about earlier. So that's something to watch. I think in, in general, though, you know, we, you know, inflation has peaked across the world and um, has have interest rates and we will see some interest rate declines this year which should be good for for markets generally so um so i think we can that's an optimistic note particularly when you um combine it with what i regard as um you know an attractive valuation on on uk equities so so i'm cautiously optimistic looking ahead 
Well, that's absolutely brilliant and a great note to, uh, to I guess, finish the Q&A on there, uh, Job. So thank you very much indeed. And thank you to everybody for your engagement this afternoon. Um, Job, I'm going to shortly redirect uh, all the attendees on today's call to give you their thoughts and expectations uh, via some feedback. But I wondered if I may, before doing so, just come back to you for a couple of closing comments. Yes, I just wanted really to finish on that concluding slide that you know we've got the longest dividend record of any investment trust achieved through consistent companies and the investment trust structure, competitive charges and a long term record of outperformance. And, you know, looking ahead, I'm cautiously optimistic. Job, that's very kind. And thank you once again for your time uh, this afternoon. Could I please ask investors now not to close this session as we'll now automatically redirect you for the opportunity to provide your feedback in order that Job and the team can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete, but I'm sure will be greatly valued uh, by the team. On behalf of the team from the City of London Investment Trust PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation and wish you all a very good afternoon.